All right, welcome to our uh, class, Leviticus for Beginners, uh, subtitled Training for Holiness. This is lesson number uh, 10, and it's entitled uh, Attaining Holiness, Distinguishing Between Clean and Unclean, and we'll be uh, covering, uh, if the Lord is willing, chapters 11 all the way to chapter 15, verse 33. Well, our lesson subtitle factors into every aspect of the entire book of Leviticus, Training for Holiness, because God stated that He was Himself the holy God and thus required that His, cho uh, His chosen people be holy as well. Holiness, as far as God was concerned, meant that uh, He was uh, and is uh, transcendent. And uh, the difficulty is trying to mm, interpret that word transcendent. We, we understand that it's a word that can be applied to describe God, but what is exactly, what, what does it mean to be transcendent? Some of the words uh, used to describe this quality, words like glorious, incomprehensible, inscrutable, just a few words to try to describe the nature of, of God. Every characteristic of God is so uniquely glorious that it cannot be fully measured or grasped. This means, for example, that we learn from the scriptures that God is loving. John chapter three, verse 16, for example, for God so loved the world. Uh, and so uh, we learn that God is loving, that He is even the embodiment of love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says that God is love. But even with this knowledge, we still cannot accurately plumb the depths and the heights of His capacity to love just ourselves, let alone love every single human being from Adam to the, the end of time. You know, we can say that, but it's hard for us to grasp a type of being that is able to do such a thing. So the Jews uh, used the word uh, kadash, which meant sanctified or consecrated or separated. In God's case, it referred to his otherness, his complete separateness from sinful man and of course, a sinful world. He was separate in kind and could not be measured. He could only be adored and obeyed. There was and is no other possible or acceptable reaction or interaction uh, that one could have with a being whose name was the only present one. His name means the, own, uh, the always present one. So you know, how, do you, how do you respond to one like this? How do you interact with one like this? The answer is through adoration, through obedience. So this holy God chose for himself and his divine purpose, a people from one man, Abraham, which he formed into a nation and revealed his holy self to them and commanded that they become a holy nation themselves. We read in Leviticus chapter 11, uh, verse 45, it says, For I am the Lord who brought you out of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. And this theme runs all the way through Leviticus. You shall be holy, for I am holy. Of course, the nation could not be holy in the same manner that God was holy, after all, he was divine and they were human. However, they could reach an attitude and a practice that would make them separate and consecrated when compared to other nations, not when compared to God. One way to reach this state of holiness, this state of separateness, consecration, glory, was to differentiate between what was clean and what was unclean according to God's command, not according to human wisdom or desire. And so to put our study into context, holiness before God or to be a holy people of God 
the nation needed the following. First, it needed a holy manner of approaching and interacting with God in order to thank Him, to ask for forgiveness, to praise Him, and to show one's appreciation of Him. And so the tabernacle and the sacrificial system were given as the holy place and the holy manner that a people could approach a holy God. Secondly, the individuals who were serving as intermediaries between the people and God were also holy, having been consecrated and ordained as priests by God Himself through Moses. And thirdly, now the people themselves were to strive to become holy by learning to differentiate between the holy God considered clean as opposed to unclean in five areas of daily living experienced by all Jews. Knowing the clean from the unclean in these five areas led to personal holiness because it would separate the Jewish nation from all other nations around it. And so chapters 11 to 15 provide the details concerning clean and unclean in the following areas. And so in broad terms, first area, clean and unclean as far as living creatures are concerned. Here God defines which animals were clean, thus defining what His people could and could not eat. In this section, He also describes how His people could contract a state of uncleanness and what was to be done when such a thing happened. In Leviticus chapter 9 verses 15 to 21, Aaron had offered sacrifice on behalf of the people to cleanse them of sin and the appearance of the glory of the Lord to the people confirmed that the sacrifice on their behalf was acceptable to God. Just as the resurrection of Jesus proves that His sacrifice on our behalf was also acceptable to God. The people were made holy by the sacrifice of the priest. The discerning of clean and unclean maintained that holiness and it also witnessed that holiness to the nations around them. The most obvious visible witness was the food that they ate and what they didn't eat. This was you know, noticeable to other nations. Now because of time constraints, I will explain the divisions and the reasons for various rituals which will enable you to read the details with a clearer understanding of their system. We're going through all of Leviticus. I'm going through every section explaining the meaning of the sections and you know, what, what, uh, what has been written. But you have, to, you have to read ahead. You have to have read the section so that when I uh, begin to explain it, uh, it'll make a whole lot more sense uh, to you because we just don't have time in the class to read every verse before I begin my explanation. All right, so if you want in-depth explanation for each command and ritual, then I encourage you to read the commentary which uh, has nearly 600 pages filled with details. Uh, otherwise, this uh, class will give you uh, a summary of these, uh, of these details. So what we're doing here is, as I said, summarizing a complex set of regulations regarding food and other human behaviors. So there were four categories of creatures that would or would not be eaten, or rather that could or could not be eaten. The first uh, section, the first category were animals. Leviticus chapter 11 verses one to eight. For an animal to be considered clean and thus allowed to be eaten, uh, the conditions were first, it had to have a split hoof, meaning you know, divided into two toes, if you wish. That was the first condition. The second condition was it was an animal that chewed the cud, meaning it ruminated, chewing its food to soften it and to produce additional saliva to aid digestion. So animals had to have both of these features in order to be classified as clean and thus edible. Having only one feature rendered the animal unclean. So if a person touched uh, 
a living unclean animal, like a, like a camel for example, he was not affected. But if he touched an unclean animal that was dead, he became unclean and had to undergo a process in order to regain his clean status once again. And when I say his clean status, I'm talking about his ceremonially clean status. In other words, being able to participate in worship once again. Another category was uh, fish, Le uh, Leviticus no, uh, 11, nine to 12. Fish also had to have both fins and scales in order to be uh, considered clean and thus uh, edible. Another category, birds, Leviticus 11, 13 to 19. For birds, God simply listed 20 kinds of birds that were considered unclean, leaving the remaining types as clean and edible. The common feature of the unclean birds was that they were meat eaters, many of which were scavenger or birds that ate rodents like squirrels and mice and so on and so forth. Fourth category, winged insects, 11, uh, Leviticus 11, 20 to 23. Insects in general were considered unclean. The exceptions were various types of locusts, uh, you know, what we call grasshoppers, and crickets. Uh, crickets have a long and ancient history of food among Middle Eastern people. There was no penalty for eating unclean food, but if one did, he had to follow the procedure to remove this uncleanness from his soul. All right, another division was contracting and dealing with uncleanness. Leviticus 11, 24, all the way to verse 40. The various rules and procedures for ridding oneself of uncleanness due to contact with unclean things or creatures that were dead or clean creatures that had died could be summarized in three statements. First, touching the carcass of a dead unclean animal made one unclean. Secondly, the remedy for uncleanness was washing with water and allowing a certain time to pass, usually waiting till evening when a new day began. And then thirdly, dead animals contaminated things and those things had to be cleaned to be decontaminated. If that was not possible, the unclean things were destroyed. Unclean things touching cooking vessels required them to be washed, like uh, clothing, for example, or wooden objects, skin or a sack. However, contact with an earthen vessel, like a bowl or a cup, required the vessel to be destroyed because of its porous nature. So if an unclean thing was in a uh, earthen vessel for a time, you know, some mouse died inside of a, uh, an earthen bowl, uh, you couldn't just clean the earthen bowl, it had to be destroyed for fear that uh, uh, some of the decay of the animal had seeped into the, uh, into the bowl itself. We move on to a, um, another section and that is reasons for clean and unclean laws. Why, why, were, you know, why did they have these, uh, these laws? And this information is in Leviticus chapter 11 verses 41 to 47. And so God reveals the reasoning behind these laws. First, he himself is holy. That's always the base, all right? That's always the, 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 the base idea. It begins with, well, God is holy. Then, because he was holy, he insisted that his people be holy. And then thirdly, following these laws about clean and unclean would help them remain holy, meaning ritually clean, so they could approach him at the tabernacle or the temple in order to worship and have fellowship with God. Contact with unclean creatures did not make a person sinful, but unclean for purposes of worship. In other words, no sacrifices were necessary to remove uncleanness only washing and waiting, along with denied entry to the uh, place of worship. Some scholars have offered other reasons for the clean and unclean laws, and I list some of those here. First, 
they helped avoid practices connected to idolatry. For example, the eating of blood was forbidden for, uh, for uh, Jews. Uh, but pagan nations uh, you know, uh, had this practice. They ate everything. Secondly, to distinguish Jews from other nations that had no food restrictions whatsoever. And then thirdly, to promote general health and welfare. Uh, for example, eating carcasses or certain insects or birds or marine life that would lead to illness, things that were unknown at that time. This, uh, these laws here would help them in this, uh, in this area. Another category, uncleanness and childbirth in Leviticus chapter 12, verses one to eight. Now in this chapter, the focus is on the clean and unclean status of the mother after giving birth and the procedure uh, to becoming clean, again, ceremonially clean once again after a child had been born. So there was a difference between having a male child or having a female child. Uh, if, one had, if, a, if a woman gave birth to a male child, well, uh, she, not the child, but she was unclean because she had the loss of blood and she remained that way for seven days. Anyone who touched her or anything she sat on would be unclean and would need to be washed. She would have uh, the baby circumcised on the eighth day. The eighth day would also begin her final 33 days of restricted uncleanness. Uh, she would not contaminate others or things that she touched, but still was not allowed to enter into the temple. So it was kind of a, you know, like a degrading scale. The first seven days, unclean, anything she touched, anybody who touched her was unclean. Then after the seventh day, the eighth day, the, the, the last 33 days, it was only her own personal uh, uncleanness that had, to be, uh, that had to be dealt with. Now, for those who gave birth to a female child, there was a slight difference. There was the same procedures, except the time of uncleanness was doubled to 14 days. And the time uh, that she was restricted was doubled to 66 days when she was restricted from entering the tabernacle or the temple in order to offer sacrifice. All right, uh, another condition was uh, after the period of the mother's ritual uncleanness was over, the woman could come and offer sacrifice uh, in order to remove her ritual uncleanness caused by the flow of blood connected to the birthing process. Scholars suggest that the isolation of the mother with her baby because of her ritual uncleanness uh, worked to her advantage. For example, it lowered the risk of infection and contamination by exposure to people and things. It also provided a time of rest from daily chores and the opportunity to bond with the new baby. It also protected her from premature return to conjugal life with her husband and duties. And fourthly, uh, it, the double time for girls was given because they were believed to be more fragile and required more time to strengthen and to stabilize them. We know, however, that if the rules were commands from God, they ultimately had the best interests of the mother and the child at heart. Another division uh, about clean and unclean was the uncleanness of leprosy, uh, Leviticus chapter 13 and uh, 14. In these two chapters, uh, they deal with the diagnosing of the skin disease commonly known as leprosy and the response by the priests uh, to the one who had this uh, illness. Uh, I want to give you a little bit of background about leprosy and how it was perceived at the time. First of all, the Hebrew word uh, tsarath, uh, translated into the English word leprosy, did not exclusively refer to what we know as Hansen's disease, where people, you know, they, they begin losing feeling in their extremities and they become uh, deformed and the, you know, their fingers fall off and they lose body parts. Uh, it's a disease that is highly contagious and was until recently incurable. Um, 
the Hebrew word meant a lesion or a plague or a blow or an itch or an eczema. Like the word cancer today, it described a variety of similar ailments that had similar symptoms, but degrees of seriousness from benign lesions to chronic and incurable leprosy. Just like cancer today, you have so many different types of cancer. Some are benign, you just, they just snip off the, the skin part or you know, the polyp and you're fine. You know, others you know, are, are very serious. Same thing uh, with leprosy in that time. Um, God provided the various ways to diagnose the different skin diseases and charge the priests uh, with this uh, responsibility. So in a way, the priests were the very first physicians of the Jewish nation responsible with the three main tasks. First, they diagnosed the illness. Now they didn't treat uh, or dispense any medicines to heal. They simply diagnosed the illness that the person had. Secondly, they quarantined people suspected of having a contagious illness. And thirdly, they re-examined those in quarantine in order to determine if they could rejoin society or have to return to quarantine permanently in order to protect the camp from infection. So we read in chapter 13 verses one to eight the uh, general instructions given. The chapter begins with instructions for the priests uh, when someone was brought to them suspecting that they might have uh, leprosy. It was the priest's prerogative to determine what was clean or unclean since a person with a temporary or non-malignant sore or condition either remained clean or go through a cleansing process after he healed. A person, however, found to have leprosy remained unclean for the rest of his life. Uh, some examples uh, that were given in Leviticus 13, 9 to 44, uh, real life cases are described. For example, they talk about a swelling in the skin or a boil on the skin. They describe a burn on the skin or infection on the head or on the chin, uh, bright spots or infection on uh, someone's bald head and go into some detail about these uh, things, description and detail and what the priest needed to do. Then they talk about the consequences of leprosy in Leviticus 13, 45 and 6. The consequences for the one infected was separation. Separation from the people and uh, separation from worship at the tabernacle. Reinstatement was possible if the illness left the person and he was verified, he or she was verified by the priests. This is why Jesus sent the leper that he had healed to go show himself to the priests. There was a process, the priest had to certify that the leprosy was gone, uh, that the person went through the uh, cleansing process and was uh, now able to rejoin normal life and normal worship at the uh, temple. Um, another uh, division, another thing they talk about uh, in um, 45 and six, it says, as for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn and the hair of his head shall be uncovered. He shall cover his mustache and cry, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection, he is unclean. He shall live alone, his dwelling shall be outside the camp. So this seems harsh, but the only um, uh, treatment that they had was to quarantine. They had nothing to treat the illness. They couldn't cure the illness in any way. Uh, so the only thing they could do was prevent the illness from spreading in the camp. And the only way to do that was a strict quarantine of the individuals that had the uh, illness. They go on to talk about the garments uh, that had leprosy in Leviticus 13. Obviously, a piece of clothing could not contract a human disease, but destructive mildew or fungus or mold affected clothing as leprosy or other ailments affected the skin. 
the approach was the same in that the priests examined the garment and decided if it was simply to be washed, quarantined, and then re-examined or burned. Seeing that the Israelites did not have many changes of uh, clothing, to destroy a piece of clothing was a, a significant loss. The detailed guidelines, however, enabled the priest to judge if a particular piece of clothing uh, was clean or unclean. We need to remember that clean or unclean in the context of skin diseases or clothing infected with mold or other rot, these things were not determinations of sinfulness, but rather pertain to ritual cleanness for the purpose of approaching God in worship. Another section they talk about is the cleaning process for one who had been a leper in chapter 14. There were required rituals that are explained. The priest would inspect the leper to render him free from illness. And then there was a ceremony of cleansing involved. First, a cleansing ritual involving two birds by a priest, then washing, shaving, entering the camp, but not one's tent for seven days. On the seventh day, the individual was to shave off all of his hair. He was to bathe his body, wash his clothes. Then he was clean and his cleansing was public knowledge. Sacrifices had to be offered to complete the process. This was done on the eighth day uh, of the process in order to purge his pollution from the sanctuary and give thanks to God for his healing. Finally, once certified as cleansed, he, would then, uh, he was then required to make a guilt, a sin, and a burnt offering with a grain offering. So this was the process when someone was healed from their leprosy in order to uh, come back into the camp into his own home and ultimately back into uh, worship at the uh, tabernacle. There were also provisions for those who were poor in Leviticus 14. God also instructed that a poor person could make a lesser offering but attain the same result, which was cleanness. The idea, that, uh, the idea was that one who was financially disadvantaged was not to be spiritually disadvantaged. Poor people could still please the Lord. Another section was uh, houses that had uh, leprosy. And uh, we read about that in Leviticus chapter 14, 33 to 53. The instructions uh, in this section were really meant for the future when uh, the people would uh, enter and settle in the promised land and then uh, they would be living in homes or houses that they either built or captured from the people that they would displace, the, the Canaanites. The laws are similar to those for cleansing garments from mold or min, uh, mildew and uh, referred to as leprosy. At, at the first sign, the priest was called in to determine if the house was to be cleansed or stripped down and replastered or completely destroyed. This was based on the degree of infestation and if it would be removed, if it could be removed permanently. If a house could be repaired and restored without infection, then the priest would perform a cleaning ceremony to render the house clean and thus its residents ritually clean as well. So long as the house was unclean, so were the people who lived in the house. That was the motivation to uh, have the house uh, cleansed. Uh, we read in Leviticus 14 the following. It says, this is the law for any mark of leprosy, even for a scale and for the leprous garment or house and for a swelling and for a scab and for a bright spot to teach when they are unclean and when they are clean. This is the law of leprosy. So here God confirms that these rules and regulations are his commands in dealing with leprosy on the body, in clothing and in their homes. This is how to discern and deal with the command to be holy by discerning between clean and unclean 
in the matters of leprosy. Another main section that comes up is uncleanness by bodily discharges in Leviticus uh, chapter 15 verses 1 to uh, 33. This chapter reviews ritual purity, again clean and unclean, and those regulations related to human sexuality, to uncleanness caused by body secretions from both male and female uh, sexual organs, and the process of restoring ritual purity. This chapter is divided into five parts. The first part is the uncleanness brought about by a man's abnormal discharges, Leviticus chapter 15. This would refer to a disease like gonorrhea, for example, which would produce the continual loss of a whitish fluid uh, over time. This would render a man unclean and anything he came into contact with was also defiled. The, uh, this impurity was removed by washing and a day's quarantine until sundown. Once he was healed, in other words, the infection and the discharge stopped, he would then quarantine for seven days, wash his clothes and his body, and then offer two birds, one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering uh, by the priest. He and the camp would then be ritually clean. The second example, um, the uncleanness caused by a man's uh, normal discharge. We read here in uh, chapter 15, verses uh, 16 to 18. It says, now, if a man has a seminal emission, he shall bathe all his body in water and be unclean until evening. As for any garment or any leather on which there is seminal emission, it shall be washed with water and be unclean until evening. If a man lies with a woman so that there is a seminal emission, they shall both bathe in water and be unclean until evening. So these instructions refer to involuntary nocturnal, uh, nocturnal emissions, as well as normal intercourse with one's wife. The emission of seminal fluid rendered a man ritually impure and required that both he and his wife bathe before they could resume their religious activities. Another example uh, that was given, uh, uncleanness caused by a woman's normal discharge, uh, Leviticus chapter 15. A woman was considered ritually unclean for seven days after the start of her uh, periods. Um, anything she touched or anyone who touched her or where she sat became impure. If she had sexual relations with her husband, the both of them were considered unclean for seven days. At the end of her cycle, she was considered clean again since her menstrual flow stopped no need for special offerings since this was a natural monthly occurrence. Another example given, uh, a woman's uh, uncleanness caused by uh, a discharge lasting many days. The reason here, an ongoing discharge for women to be unclean was the same as men. In a woman's case, it was usually a problem with her cycle or some other illness whose symptom was a discharge of some kind. To return to ritual purity was also the same as for men. Once the flow stopped, she was in quarantine for seven days. She washed her clothes and her body and offered the two birds at the tabernacle. This offering would signal her ritual purity and her thanksgiving and recommitment to, to God. So to finish up, we have a summary statement here in Leviticus chapter 15, 31 to 33. We want to finish today's uh, session and this section and this topic, which I have kind of compressed all into one lesson. And so in Leviticus 15, 31, it says, thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, so that they will not die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is among them. This is the law for the one with a discharge and for the man who has a seminal emission so that he is unclean by it. 
and for the woman who is ill because of menstrual impurity and for the one who has a discharge, whether a male or a female or a man who lies with an unclean woman. And so this explains the reasons that these laws were given. First, to preserve the holiness of the tabernacle. No one in an unclean state could come you know, close to God. Secondly, to prevent anyone who was ritually impure from even approaching the tabernacle. And thirdly, to avoid the serious consequences for the impure to approach God. Remember I said the holiness of God was the basis of all of these rules. He was holy, therefore they had to be holy. And in order to remain holy, uh, to have a, an ongoing relationship with him, they had to uh, adhere to these uh, rules uh, in their lives about what they ate, about the condition of their uh, bodies. All right, well, here we go. Uh, a little assignment. Uh, I um, give you chapter 16 to read before, we, uh, before you watch the next video. Uh, make sure that you read chapter 16. I can't, I can't emphasize how important this is. I don't read every single verse, but if you read the verses and you're familiar with the verses, then the explanation that I give during the class will make a whole lot more sense. All right, thank you for your attention. We'll see you next time for our next class. God bless.